Lord, as we sing songs, as we worship you, as we study your word tonight, we ask that you would be high and lifted up in our minds and in our hearts. Lord, you are on the throne. And may we recognize that tonight as we gather and worship, Lord. This is always a, a, a special time when believers gather for uh, us to be aware of your presence with us. So be magnified. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you guys want to stand with us, please stand. If you want to stay seated, you can stay seated, but let's worship the Lord together.
the chariots with
shall draw you out the Lord of all. The one who calms the wind and waves makes my heart be still. Though the earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage, I know my God is in control. The oceans roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the winds and waves and makes my heart be still. Though the earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage. I know my God is in control. Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. worship you tonight, Lord. We thank you that you are with us. Though the oceans roar and the earth gives way, we know our God is in control. And certainly the oceans are roaring. What looks like uh, uh, the foundation is just falling down around us, but our foundation is built on you. And we don't hope like people in the world. Our hope is in you. And you are a great and mighty and powerful King of kings and Lord of lords. song of ages to the land. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name stands above them all. song forever to the Lamb. If you walk in freedom, and if you bear his name, sing the song forever to the Lamb. We'll sing the song forever, forever and amen. amen, and the angels cry. creation cries oh, holy you are lifted high oh, holy holy forever do your people sing oh, holy to the king of kings oh, Your name 
the great is your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all your name your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all your thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy of creation Thank you for your holiness, God, and we thank you that you are, you've called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. You've called us to be holy, for you are holy. And we thank you, God. We thank you that you've given us your word. You've given us the statutes to live by in this world, and we thank you for your precious son who died for us to make it possible for us to be empowered by the Spirit to live according to your word. And Father, I pray tonight that the Spirit would give us ears to hear what you say tonight. We open up your word and we, and we look at the foundations of creation, the foundations of man, the, the beginnings of all of it, Lord. May we be encouraged and exhorted. May we be filled with joy and may we be challenged. May your word meet us here like a sharp two-edged sword, piercing us, Lord, piercing our heart, dividing soul and spirit you are holy. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we ready? Who do who? All right, we're going to be in Genesis 4. So uh, open your Bible to the very first page and turn to the right. Oh, I can't help you on your phone. Just keep scrolling until you get there. Genesis chapter 4, story of Cain and Abel. So we'll be working our way through uh, uh, the book of Genesis. It's important that we see chapter 4. As Moses puts together uh, the book of Genesis, as he is responding to the things that are around him in his time, as he is uh, uh, laying forth the word, um, immediately after chapter 3, when we hear the promise uh, that is called the Proto-Evangelicum in Genesis 3.15, if you guys uh, remember it, just flip over there. <laughs> <clears throat> for just a second, keep it fresh in our minds because part of the purpose behind chapter four is the Lord laying out for 
the people um, this common thread, this thread that we're going to see uh, working its way through the Old Testament um, all the way until we, ar- until we arrive uh, at Jesus Christ. And, and um, then we hold the promises of Christ in the same way. So let's look at it. He's going to say in, in uh, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you, speaking to the serpent. I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring, to speak to the serpent, and her offspring. And the first battle, if you will, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, the promised seed through which Christ will come, is the next chapter. Now, the reason we'll know that just as a little bit of foreshadowing, if you go back to verse 14 in Genesis 3, and uh, the Lord is beginning to dole out the consequences to the fall, right? To the fall of man. And he begins with the serpent. This is the only one he says this to. He does not curse Adam and he does not curse Eve. But I want you to look. He says to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you. So the the serpent receives a direct curse. That's going to play into that phrase. Moses is going to use that phrase more than one time as he points to the players, if you will, in the family of the seed of the serpent. And if you think of the seed of the serpent in the sense of those who are at war with God's plan, Satan and his minions and those who choose to follow him, That's going to help you understand who are they. Um, And then the seed of the woman is going to be the line of Christ, right? Jesus is going to be coming through that line. And you'll really see it, the foreshadowing of it laid out for us in chapter 4. So if you think about what occurred in chapter 3, keep that kind of in your mind as we jump into Genesis chapter 4. And we hear the story of Cain and Abel. So it begins in verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Now, again, if you read this in several English translations, you'll discover it's another clunky English phrase that makes more sense in, in the original Hebrew. But what she's saying is she thinks the promise is happening. There's never been a child born, right? No children have been born. None of this stuff has happened. And now here's Eve, and as she is giving birth to a child, what was the promise? The last thing she heard from the Lord, the seed of the woman, a human birthed from a woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. And she thinks it's Cain. She's like, I got him. Here he is. Now, you and I know sometimes the promises of God take a little longer than that to to come around, right? Uh, so this, that's what it means in, in the name that she gives him, Cain. Uh, the phrase, oftentimes when you read the Old Testament and you're reading a story and they say, oh, she named her child this, and then there's a statement after that. The statement after that is loosely wrapped into the meaning of the name. So the meaning of Cain is, I have gotten So she's like, I have received. Basically, she's saying, God created Adam, and look, we, me and Adam, we just made another life. There's a lot of kind of interesting things going on in Eve's mind, right? It's it's hard for us to even fathom because for us, you know, none of this is new. But for them, that's the first baby. Now, there'll be a lot more. But that's the first baby. And so she's saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. So the Lord, he gave us his promise and here he is. Here's our deliverer. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. You notice there's an after, after that. And Abel's name, you know, some, of, some scholars think it's like to breathe or... Uh, or fade away, 
which is kind of interesting, but we, you know, it's hard to nail down ancient Hebrew exactly. So as they're working through, we have two kinds. Now, usually here is where I think a lot of Bible teachers go crazy. Because we're in Genesis chapter 4. We have no idea how long man has been rumbling around the earth since creation. But the first child born is Cain. Second child born is Abel. We know if they're tilling the ground and taking care of the sheep, they've at least grown, right? These aren't a couple of three-year-olds. So these are probably grown men now taking care. So you have some time that has passed. But even in all that time that has passed, has God ever commanded them that we know of that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin? There's no command. In, has he even told them how to do an offering? No. Has there been any instruction in that regard? Now, look, we know that in chapter 3, God clothed Adam and Eve. So there was probably something that occurred, at least, that required the death of an animal that clothed Adam and Eve. But there's nothing that the Bible, the text doesn't tell us that. So to start here and say the reason why Cain's going to bring an offering and God doesn't like it is because there's no blood. Because that's not true. There are grain offerings. The offerings of God are not only blood offerings. So we don't want to get caught up in that idea. They also will already make the decision <coughs> because they know the end of the story that Cain's evil. So of course he has all these bad attitudes, but in the story, we don't know that yet. Do we, we just have two guys who are going into the presence of God. Here's another thing for us to think about. Where was that? Where did they meet God? Now, um, Dr. Henry Morris has a book called The Genesis Record. I actually like <clears throat> what he talks about in, in this section because one of the things he talks about is the idea that they met where the cherubim were. So you remember when God threw them out of the Garden of Eden. He guarded the way back to the garden by two cherubim and a sword, right? And so you have these two cherubim at the opening of the way to the garden of eden now they don't need to be there anymore because the flood comes and you couldn't find the garden of eden if you had to but at the time of adam and eve you they still knew where it was so we think that probably when people wanted to go speak to the lord they'd go back there now that would make sense because you remember we talked about last time whenever the high priest or the priest would bring the offering to god in the temple, where did they bring it to? Where did they bring the blood? They poured it between the cherubim. You have the same picture, right? Two cherubim at the entrance, two cherubim on the uh, Ark of the Covenant, which is going to be like the standard place where the priest is going to go into the presence of God. So we don't know for sure because the text doesn't tell us, but it's, it's something we can possibly reason out, right? But somehow... These two guys know how to go into the presence of God and bring him an offering, right? So there's no talk of building altars, none of that. So we don't really know, you know, what that was like. But we know we have these two boys, these two brothers gathered together. We have this great idea that Eve thinks the promise is going to come through Cain and uh, I don't know, if you ever grew up in a family, there's something always special about the firstborn, right? If you're a middle or a youngest, you know, them dirty firstborn children always get all the love and, right? And so here, here, you know, this is, this is special. He's special. And so it says, in the course of time, more time has passed, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was angry and his countenance, his face fell. So here we are in the prelude to murder. The prelude to murder, just like Jesus said. Isn't that interesting? You remember when Jesus said this? Jesus is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, you've heard it said, 
thou shalt not murder. But I say to you, if you hate your brother, you've already murdered him in your heart. And here, the very first murder in the Bible is between two brothers when one's angry at the other. So we have in the prelude, we have the idea that offerings are brought. Now, just so you have a clear understanding that it, you can bring offerings other than blood offerings to the Lord, Leviticus chapter 2 um, gives us that direction. We'll look at a couple of spots just so you can see. Uh, Leviticus 2, 1 through 3. When anyone brings a grain offering or an offering to the Lord, that offering shall be a fine flour. He'll pour oil on it, put frankincense on it, bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and they'll take from it a handful of the fine flour and oil with all its frankincense, and the priests will burn it as its memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with a pleasant aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering will be given to Aaron and his sons, it is the most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. So that's an offering of the fruit of the ground. In verse 14, Leviticus 2, if you offer grain offerings of first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer for the grain offering your first fruits, fresh ears roasted with fire, fresh new grain, put oil and frankincense on it. It is a grain offering and the priest will burn a memorial portion, uh, some of the crushed grain, some of the oil with its frankincense. It is a food offering to the Lord. So it's, it's not mandatory, even when the law is given, that you can only bring a blood offering. But there is something in the text that I think indicates the problem. Something that we just read that helps us understand why is one received and one rejected so let's look back at it it says now Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground there's a word missing there that is <clears throat> there in the next one the next one it says Abel gave the firstborn of his flock when you brought a grain offering to the Lord it is the same as bringing the blood offering but it needed to be what first fruits that means before you gathered for yourself, before you filled up your barn, before you stashed away all your things, you brought the beginning of the harvest to the Lord as a thanksgiving for what God has provided for you. That's the same purpose behind the offering that Abel brought. But Cain, it doesn't say it's his first fruits. It does say it is Abel's. Now, there's another thing that I want you to understand. God's going to recognize something's wrong with Cain, right? Now, look, none of this took God by surprise. He knows what's coming. But he is willing to confront Cain with what's in his heart. He tells him about it. But Cain never asked the question, why wasn't mine received? It never crosses his mind to say, because it sounds like it's reversible, right? Well, look at the very next verse, and you'll see it. The very next verse as we look at, at uh, verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? That means whatever the issue was, it's reversible, right? It's like, hey, I can, I can do this right. I'm not trapped in a eternal wrongheadedness, right? I can respond properly, um, but that's not even part of what's going on in the mind or the heart of Cain. Sometimes we look and we, we downplay what it means that man is in a fallen state. Man's natural tendency is not toward God, ever, until God first has reached out and touched man. Now, for these guys, they are able to go to the Lord. They're able to come before him and worship. But you can see already in the offering that's given that Abel has a desire to <clears throat> please or honor or worship God, and Cain 
is going through motions, doing just what needs to be done. And in his heart, there's not the question of, well, Lord, what do I need to do? What do, what do I need to do? When we look later on in the New Testament, we're confronted by two guys who I think basically do the same thing. One is Judas and the other is Peter. Judas does not return to the Lord, come to the Lord as a savior to seek anything. He goes to suicide as a savior. And Peter, he returns to the Lord. Now, not because he's better, not because he, his crime is less. They both basically betray God, no? On, on the same night. <clears throat> but you have one whose desire is to have a relationship with the God of the universe. And you have one whose desire wasn't. And the Bible tells us that was in the heart of Judas from the beginning, just like it tells us this is in the heart of Cain from the beginning. This is, this is um, part of where, where Cain's heart just was. He, the Lord says to him, look, if you do well, you'll be accepted. And then he gives him the warning. Sin is crouching at the door. The picture is like sin is a wild animal that's going to try to eat you, right? Sin is crouching at the door and its desire is contrary to you. It wants to destroy you. Sin's desire is just hiding outside the door. If you open the door, sin will destroy you. But listen to what the Lord says to him. You must rule over it. Now, I believe God could, God's commandments are his enablements. If God says you must rule over it, Cain had the opportunity to rule over it. He could have made different choices. But he doesn't make different choices the lord confronts him in the moment tells him this thing can be corrected we can turn this ship around <clears throat> we don't have to see the loss of everything if you do right you'll be accepted and then he warns him hey sin's at the door kind of like jesus telling those scribes and the pharisees who were plotting his murder if you hate your brother you've committed murder already to the same guys who are planning his murder while Jesus is talking to them. Interesting, no? Here you have the, the Lord God doing the same thing, reaching out in the same way. So the Lord God brings before him the idea of the particular sin he's struggling with, warns him of the danger of that sin, and tells him how to escape it. But you have to want something different, right? So you have verse 8. So Cain spoke to his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. So the same ground that Cain used to bring forth fruit, the hope of Cain's mother, Eve, at the deliverance that would come from his son is all spilled in the form of Abel's blood in the same field he's trying to grow grain in. He spoke to his brother, he rose up, and he killed him. This is Cain's little brother, who no doubt was just like him, right? Same mom and dad. They look alike. Probably smiled the same way, had some of the same manuris, uh, mannerisms, right, that you see from one to the other. Same flesh, maybe the same eyes. When he looked into Abel's eyes, they're, it's like looking at your own, looking into his brother's eyes. And yet, <clears throat> you have this murderous deed of Cain which is an illustration for us of the words that Jesus has taught us. Anger and bitter feelings toward another brother end in murder. 
That is what is in our heart, which is simply just showing us <clears throat> the full outcome of our own anger. How many stories end like this? Cain and Abel is just the first one. It's not the last one, is it? No, our, our church has endured something similar, similar to this not that long ago. So you have, you have this, this battle taking place. The very first murder, when we see it at the, at the entry place or the, the uh, gathering place to worship God. Maybe not a lot has changed in human history. So the next part we have is the judge and the criminal. So we read about it in verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, where's Abel, your brother? Now, I'm assuming the Lord doesn't go looking for Cain. I'm assuming Cain is coming back to the place where they would go to bring their offering or their, their uh, uh, relationship with God. I think that was part of their normal practice to gather there uh, outside of Eden. I think they didn't go very far from Eden. I think they were expecting in their lifetime to be able to return because the seed of the woman was going to crush the head of the serpent and they were going to be redeemed. But I can't prove any of that. But what I know is God reaches out to Cain and he says, where's your brother? It seems natural to me that it would happen in the same place where the offerings were, but it doesn't have to be. So the Lord asks him, where's your brother? And he does two things. He lies first, and then he is evasive and indifferent. First he lies. I don't know. Does he know? Sure he knows. And then he says, and then he says, uh, am I my brother's keeper? Now, certainly traditionally, in the family, the nucleus of the family, uh, almost from the beginning, the firstborn was considered the priest of the family, uh, the one who, for whom the responsibility for the others rested. That doesn't really change all that much. You know, even in our lives, if you were firstborn, you were the first one babysitting your brothers and your sisters as you grew up. He asks the question, am I my brother's keeper? I lie, I don't know where he's at, and I don't really care. I don't really care because you can already see the hard-heartedness in the life of Cain, right? And so the Lord says this phrase, what have you done? Man, what a heartbreak. What a heartbreak to see the first murder being brothers. It was destined to be so because ultimately that hasn't changed. If we go back, we have one set of parents. We're all related in some way. The Bible says we're all made from one blood. So brother's been murder and brother for quite a while. He says, the voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground, just in the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, the books written by Moses, you have this phrase used over and over and over again for blood spilled, that what innocent blood spilled. The Bible says that that blood cries out to God. You have in Genesis 18, the crimes of Sodom and Gomorrah and the, the cries have reached out to God. So he's coming to destroy those cities. In Exodus, you see the cries of the people in slavery reaching God and him coming to deliver his people as a result of their cries. And here we see God going to Cain and saying, your brother's blood is crying out to me. One of the warnings <clears throat> that God gave to the nation of Israel coming into the land of Canaan was, that if they spilled innocent blood, he would have to put them out of the land because the innocent blood would defile the land. And they did that. 
and they didn't do it any different than we did it or any other nation around the globe. Think about the, the level of the crying of innocent blood that occurs on earth today. We, um, we all have lots of opinions about lots of things when we consider all the wars going on, depending on your views of the Ukraine and Russia or your views on Israel and the Gaza. But I can tell you this, all the blood in underneath all that rubble is not guilty blood, except for the fact that it's all separated from God, sure, in that sense, right? But the children sleeping in those cribs died the same way. Does that blood not cry out to God? I wonder what level of what's re restraint it is for God not to just judge. Seems like it there's, would be a lot. Certainly over the history of man, your uh, brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now listen to the phrase in verse 11. And now the only the second person who's heard this, you are cursed. Same phrase that was on the serpent. We're going to get in a few weeks. Uh, we'll probably do chapter five next week, six after that. When we get to the flood, at the end of the flood, you're going to hear another, you are cursed. Because you're going to see this battle, if you want to call it that, this battle between human beings, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And you're going to hear this phrase repeated. It's one of the ways I think that we can indicate what's going on. Because Adam wasn't cursed. Eve wasn't cursed. Were they judged? Yes. Were they put out? Yes. But this is different language altogether. So look at what happens. He says, you are cursed from the ground. Do you remember where the serpent was cursed? You are cursed among all livestock, all the animals. So the, the serpent was cursed apart from or away from all other animals. Here, Cain is cursed from the ground. Why? Well, he's a tiller of the ground, right? That's what he was good at. He says, the ground has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So when you work the ground, it won't yield anymore. Since it drank your brother's blood, you can plant all you want. Nothing's coming. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. And you shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Now, it's interesting to me because when I look at this, I think this is light. In a, in a few years we're going to hear if man kills man by man his blood should be shed so god's going to give the death penalty to murderers but here he doesn't kill cain he makes cain a wanderer and a vagabond he tells Cain that the choice he has made, and I would say the choice that he has made has made him to be of the seed of the serpent, that now he has no people to belong to. He's, he's separated from his kin, from his family, from the promise. He is separated from all of those things. And so he is... Uh, left as a fugitive, he is left as a fugitive and a wanderer. You will have no home. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. I don't think so. It don't sound greater to me. Now, I don't know. That could just be my twisted, broken head. But I'm like, yeah, dude, you killed your brother. 
The fact that you get to breathe, have a wife, give birth to children, see grandkids, all those things your brother doesn't get, that don't seem just to me. That doesn't, that doesn't look just. But here Cain, his focus is, right, my punishment is greater than I can bear. You have driven me, behold, you have driven me today away from the ground. So the, his great love to till the field, that's gone now. And from your face, I shall be hidden. Oh, now it makes sense. You see, the idea that Cain and Abel would come into the presence of God there at the opening of the Garden of Eden, there they could talk to God and there, you know, they would bring their offerings to God and they probably did that all their lives growing up and that was something maybe that they appreciated uh, in their growing up and now Cain knows I can't go back there. I can't go back. So not only am I cut off from my family, Cain is cut off from God. He can't go into his presence <coughs> anymore. So he cries out, "You're from your face I will be hidden and as a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth whoever finds me will kill me. I'm not going to last very long." And ultimately, I think what Cain's saying is, I, don't, I no longer have your covering. How, how am I going to live out there in, in this fallen world? He who killed his own brother now is afraid someone else will kill him. And then we have the mercy of the judge and God's word of promise. Look what he says. Then the Lord said to him, no, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. Well, that just means nobody's going to kill Cain. We're going to read Cain's lineage in a minute. Nobody killed Cain. What God is saying is, I'm not going to let anybody touch you. You're going to live out your life. What benefit is there for Cain if he lives out his life? In my mind, at least, that's the opportunity for repentance. Now, I don't know if that existed or it didn't. But the idea that God didn't take his life meant that he didn't lock Cain into a lost state. That doesn't mean Cain was, was in a right relationship with God when he died. You know, I, I'm, from all indications of what we're going to read, he wasn't. He never repents. He never wants that relationship back with God. He never pursues restoration. But when we look at the reason, we look at our world and we say, Lord, why aren't, haven't you come? Where's your judgment? God's lack of judgment is mercy. If you read the book of Revelation and you see all the hardship that is endured on the face of the earth in the book of Revelation, none of that is God's wrath. God's wrath happens at the end of each one of the judge, judgments, the seal, the bulls, the trumpets. His judgments at the, you read it, the word wrath will not appear until you get to the end of each judgment on the world ending day. Prior to that, the judgments that are poured out, the people who suffer and die, the fact that God doesn't take their life means you still have time. You can still a long life. It is a sign of God's mercy over them. If the Lord had judged me righteously for what I deserved when I was young, I would not be here today. But he gave me time. And the only reason I can be here today is because I'm covered in the blood of Christ, not because I'm good. I'm here because Christ is. So when we look at this, we, we see this, the reality of God's, I think, God's mercy over him. So it says, the Lord put a mark on Cain. So let's save us all a lot of time. Nobody knows what the mark of Cain is. Let's try that again because somebody's going to buy a book somewhere that says, wait, I had a dream and I know what the mark of Cain is. No, body knows. 
with the mark of Cain. Nobody even knows that you can see the mark of Cain. Nobody even knows that it was obvious. Does it need to be obvious? If God says you're going to live to be an old man, does he have to put a mark on you that other people can see? If the Lord has said, I'm going to live to be an old man and I'll never die on a motorcycle, I don't need a helmet. I don't need a helmet. <laughs> now, Jared will argue with me now, but he didn't used to. And it's just because he's a little uglier now that he argues with me. But before, <laughs> he was just like me. Yes, that's truth. Yeah, that's true. So when we look at it, my, my point is, <clears throat> the, it's the word that God says, look, you're, I put my mark on you. <clears throat> Nobody can touch you. Do you know <clears throat> in the book of Revelation, the Lord does that to believers? He tells the angels, stop, wait, everybody hold still until I have marked all mine. And then when he marks all of his, judgment will be poured out, but does it fall on his own? Has the Lord made a distinction like that before? In the book of Exodus, when the plagues fell, did they fall on everybody? Sometimes, not every time, sometimes the Lord made a distinction, didn't he? And so we see this. God is able <clears throat> to protect his own. So the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. I just think that mark meant it never happens. Nobody goes after Cain. So Cain, again, we come to a point where Cain can make some decisions. Cain, though he's cast out, could, could try to figure out how can, how can this be redeemed? How can I come before the Lord? But he could cry out to God right now, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me for the blood of my brother. There's probably a hundred things that could have happened, but none of them do. But the mercy of God is still on him it says then Cain, Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and he settled in the land of Nod look at the phrase east of Eden where did they always go where did Adam and Eve go they left Eden and went where east of Eden <clears throat> now you say to yourself what's the big deal they're going to the east well what gate is it that Jesus walked in to the temple mount you want to take a guess? The eastern gate, what mountain's outside the eastern gate? The Mount of Olives, when Jesus returns, what mountain does he come to? The Mount of Olives, which is where? East of the Temple Mount. You think that's all accidental? I don't think that's accidental. I think that's, that is part of the, the purpose, the fingerprints, if you will, of God laid out on the text so that we can see. So Cain, he goes, but I would say by all, by all estimates, <clears throat> whatever the mark was, it was God's amazing grace. Cain was cursed, he was separated from God, but he was also guarded by God. He was also watched over. Cain's life still belonged to God. He still bore God's image even though that image may be disfigured, it's not removed. This is, to me, one of the great pictures of the mercy of God we see in Scripture. And in any of our lives, if we look close enough, we can find it there too. God's mercy on us. Now, this chapter is going to end with two family trees. The family of Cain and the family of uh, Adam and Eve. Let's look at the fruit, if we can, of what comes from the, uh, the attitude that Cain had. Let's look. So Cain knew his wife. I know everybody's going to ask me this. So where'd Cain get his wife? One of his sisters. That's where. No, there's not other people. There were no Martians. There was not a special seating from some other planet. The Nephilim, the Nephilim is not there yet. Nope, this is just his family, right? Cain, if, if Eve gave birth to a child, as much as she could give birth to a child for the time period in which she lived, there are a lot of people on the earth. 
So one of his, and if you lived 900 years like they did, there's a lot of time, right? And I doubt they had like a thing where if you're 700 years old, you can't marry a 100-year-old. She's too young for you. I think, I don't think they had that. I don't think they had that going on. So Cain knew his wife. She conceived and bore Enoch, not the same Enoch that we'll see in a while. And he built a city, and he called the name of the city by the name of his son. So Cain builds a city, and he names it Enoch. Now, to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mehuiel, and Mehuiel fathered Methushael, and Methushael, you guys can do this too if you want, fathered Lamech, and Lamech took two wives. First person who took two wives in the family line of Cain. His name was uh, Lamech. His, he's going to come up again in a minute. Uh, the name of one was Adah, and the name of the other was Zillah. And Adah bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. And Zillah, who bore Tubal Cain, he was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. Now Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfolds, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. What's the fruit coming from the line of Cain? It's, you just have more and more disobedience and rebellion toward God, right? That's what you see in the end. And when we think about the idea, following the seed, the concept of the seed of the serpent, 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, this is what John wrote. This is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So the same idea is in the heart of John the apostle, right? As he's writing his epistles, that this becomes an example, not the only example. And it's not just the family of Cain. That's not where I'm going. But Cain and the battle between Cain and Abel was as though the Satan is saying, well, Cain's with me, so Abel must be the seed of the woman, so what do we do? You got to kill him because otherwise Christ is going to be coming through him. But was Christ to the seed of Abel? No, he's going to follow this next section. Look at verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. Look what she says. God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. You hear the brokenheartedness of a mom? How's a mom survive that? I don't know how I would. I have three boys, and it would wreck us. It would, it would absolutely uh, destroy us. And so she had a son named Seth. Now, Seth, Seth is a different story altogether, right? Another, another part we'll see of the lineage that goes to Christ, the redeemed seed, the one who brings forth the Messiah who will be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So to Seth also a son was born. And they called his name Enosh. So when we got to the end of the line of Cain, what were they boasting? Oh, if you hurt me, I'll kill you. And if you touch me, I'll kill you. And if you try to kill me, I will get vengeance 70 times 7. What happens in Seth's line? And Seth gave birth, uh, Seth's wife gave birth and uh, called his name Enosh. And at that time, what's it say? people began to call upon the name of the Lord. You see the difference? 
So when we look back at Genesis 3 and the idea that there's going to be a seed of the serpent that has enmity or makes war with the seed of the woman who is bringing forth Messiah, that is the story of the Old Testament. From Genesis through Malachi, you're going to see those things played out. And in several different battles and several different opportunities. There's one time uh, that the, the devil will have the line of Christ down to one baby and they're hunting to kill it. One baby. But you can't take out the line of Christ because God says no. But they were trying. When Jesus was born, what did the, what did the seed of the serpent do? Well, there's a bunch of little children and there's a promise of Messiah has been born in Bethlehem. What should we do? Let's kill all the babies on two and under. Right? You get what I'm saying? You see these little parts of the story that go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 when God said to Satan, your seed and mine, they're going to be fighting. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And that's the story that we'll follow as we go through. Cain's firstborn and successors built cities. They, uh, they developed arts. But Seth's firstborn and successors pioneered worship. One line moving away from God. One line moving toward him. And that's the story of Genesis chapter 4. Amen? Why don't you guys stand with me? Let's, uh, let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come before you, Lord, to open your word, to study your word. God, I pray that you would um, just continue to open our eyes to the story on the pages of Scripture, Lord, that we would, um, that we would see not only the fingerprints of your perfect plan played out for us in the Word, but help us also have eyes to see the fingerprints of your plan working in our life as well. For you are still moving and working today as you were then, until we see your face. So, Lord, we pray that you would watch over and keep us, God, as we uh, leave this place. Lord, may you be glorified and magnified in the things we say and do. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's do our doxology. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. And to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.